Let me begin with the scene from a musical drama. Sitting in a boat, anchored at the shore of an uncharted island, Mao Xin, a teenage boy, ponders the place where he is stranded. I look around, here and there. I look north and south. I look at the ocean. Occasionally, I see ships sailing with three masts the size of a banana pit. I listen to the wind blowing and the sound of the waves. There are alternating currents of water, red water, clean water and turbid water. I watch the teal birds catching fish and listen to the squawking voices of the telaim bird as it eats shellfish. I am so bored. Oh, so very bored. I'll do something I'm interested in to cure my boredom. I should set up my harp and play it to relax. Now that I've just retuned to the harp strings, I'll try and play a song to test them out. And the stage directions add, Mang Xinji tests the harp by playing the tune of Gandama Taong, or in English, Gandama Mountain. This scene marks a watershed in a Burmese opera about a boy who transforms into the deity Wu Xinji. The version I just read is taken from an 80 page long opera libretto by Gu Maoji. The libretto was published in 1908, but we can assume that dramatic companies had staged the story already before that. And to this day, the musical drama about the harpist remains one of the most important pieces in the repertoire of any dramatic company touring southern Myanmar. While different versions of the drama exist, the scene is always featured, and it always takes the same tragic course. Having tuned and played his harp in the wilderness against better knowledge, the harpist is tragically robbed of his human existence. He transforms into a deity, one that is dearly venerated by Theravada Buddhist communities of coastal Myanmar. I asked the musician Situ Te from Mie to record, probably for the first time, the 1908 version of the song by librettist Go Maungji that the protagonist of the opera sets out to sing. Let's listen. In this talk, I will consider this literal scene of boredom and music making in conjunction with commentarial work by 5th century philosopher Buddha Gosa on a canonical Buddhist text, the Pali Abhidhamma or Abhidhamma. I observe in these texts and in the musical practices they relate a media philosophical perspective. This perspective thoroughly unsettles the epistemic frameworks on which much scholarship on music and sound is premised. My talk is structured in five parts. I will begin with stating a basic concern. The second part will elaborate that concern in reference to the opera libretto and the experience of boredom. In the third part, I will say something about the construction of the harp. This will lead me back in the fourth part to Buddha Gosa, in reference to whom I will spell out some basic technique philosophical ideas. I will end by describing three medial moments in the libretto. Part one, some considerations to begin with. As scholars, we attach great value to distinctions and definitions, and we are indeed often expected to do so. We ask and answer, what is music and according to whom? Who is, who is listening, how is listening understood in a certain genre or tradition? What are the ontological and ethical assumptions about sound in a given culture? And so on. But here's my concern. Starting from 
or aiming for definitions assumes that music or sound essentially exist in the order of things. That is to say, sound as object or category is by definition conceived as such. In turn, sound is taken, or music, to transcend the various aesthetic milieus and technical relations in which it shows up. Even though we have learned to particularize our definitions according to different historical and cultural contexts, we still largely conceive of them as philosophical universals. Shrouded in generalities, the ontological and conceptual entities that we are so fond of, such as music, sound or listening, are separated by an immense abyss from the concrete material realities. Concepts and practices are merely connected by a fragile semantic tie, one that is either simply stipulated or that is conveniently delegated to the practitioners. In this talk, I attempt to turn things somewhat around by taking the figure of the harpist, the guardian of brackish water, as my cue. In the brackish water of the Ayawawadi Delta, where mangrove swarms interlace land and sea, apparently discrete things are inextricably mixed up with each other. Distinctions between heterogeneous domains such as sweet water and salt water, water and soil, mainland and island, are quite literally fluid. Settings of elemental entanglement, such as this, might tempt us to dissolve all distinctions and definitions and to embrace rhizomatic modes of thinking. But this is not the direction in which I am headed. Something else surfaces in brackish waters. It is this. Where fundamental distinctions, categories and relations are not given in advance in the order of things, a basic principle of Theravada Buddhist thought becomes evident, namely that it requires tools and technique, techniques to first of all make distinctions. According to the Abhidhamma, the canonical Theravada text, experience is entangled in all kinds of things and sensations. To clear the thicket, to distinguish and order the phenomena, tools are needed. Just like a man who uses a, quote, well-sharpened knife to disentangle a great tangle of bamboo, as 5th century philosopher Buddha Gosa had put it. At the shore of the alien island where, Ma where our harpist, Maung Shin, is trapped in deadly boredom, the tool at hand is not a knife, but a musical instrument. The Saung Gao, the arched harp. My assumption is this. It makes a difference whether you use a harp or a well-sharpened knife to disentangle the thicket of experience. Each technical object will bring about a different order of phenomena, different distinctions, different categories. The direction in which I am headed might thus be signposted as follows. Instead of settling on a definition of what music is or what sound as such does, I am interested in the interconnections between procedures and concepts. Where Buddha Gosa proposes to think with a knife, I set out to think with the harp. Let me elaborate this further by returning to the harpist at the shore. But first of all, I shall tell you how we got here. Part two, boredom at sea. Maung Shin, a teenage boy living with his mother in extreme poverty and busking to make a living, had accompanied a band of woodcutters on their boat journey through the Delta's intricate waterways. Stranded at the shore of an uncharted island, the woodcutters leave Maung Shin behind with the task of guarding the boat. Now, this is where we are. 
Maung Shin, sits in the boat anchored at the tidal threshold between land and sea. And the passage that I read at the beginning of this talk was his soliloquy. Here is a translation. It is an account of his surroundings. Out here at the shore, the world is infinite. There is hardly anything to attract the eye. The environment bursts forth as a seamless stream of themeless sensations. The wind becomes audible as it blows and even the waves sound in pointless repetition. No longer revealed by seafaring as a medium to carry boats, water becomes visible as a fluid mixture of differently colored currents. In Theravada Buddhism, a metaphor for sensuous desire. Even the cruel reality of animals eating other animals pierces Maung Shin's mind as a never-ending sight and sound. All these invoke a monstrous simultaneity, a noise that yields what Buddhists consider an unwholesome affective state. Boredom. Boredom is the vulgar continuity of everything. It is characterized by indifference and inactivity, by drifting off like pumpkins and pots which float on the water, as Buddha Gosa had put it. According to the canonical Buddhist text, the Abhidhamma, boredom is a state of a twofold delusion. First, like most other unwholesome states, it arises from an experience of permanence, whereas careful attention would reveal all phenomena to be impermanent. Second, inasmuch as boredom is a state of indifference, the world it experiences is no longer stratified according to a system of values that qualifies all relations as either good, neutral or bad. Instead, the world of boredom is one where everything is mixed up, where all things have coalesced into a single ear-splitting noise. In this sense, boredom is objectless where Niban or Nirvana is the extinction of experience, boredom, one might say, is the extinction of that which experience is about. A nothingness that harbors nothing good. The mind is like a boat, the Burmese monk and influential thinker Lady Seador wrote at the turn of the 19th century. Without a rudder, that is, without attention to an object, the mind becomes restless, unsteady, like water whipped up by the wind, a turmoil that turns the mind against itself as it starts to attend to its own mental disquiet. Yet the sea is not a mere metaphor for boredom and restlessness. Seafaring comes with boredom. As media theorist John Durham Peter writes, Boredom is the ever-present companion of the sailor, sailor who, whose time, like that of a pilot or anesthesiologist, consists of long spells of boredom interrupted by moments of terror. The disasters that loom at the horizon of boredom make seafaring ideally suitable as material for entertainment, including opera. Stories about seafaring alleviate boredom as no other stories can. But then, what to do when bored? According to the Abhidhamma, unwholesome states such as boredom can be remedied through techniques of passing and distinguishing until noise gives way to calmness, until consciousness ceases to drift like a hollow pumpkin on the surface of the water and instead sings into the object, as Buddha Gosa had put it. And here comes the rift. Although Buddhism prescribes meditation to conquer boredom, the protagonist of the opera chooses music as his cure. And this is precisely where things go wrong. 
With the harp in one's hand and its musical sound all around, the world may look completely different. According to the story about the harpist Maungshin, music making is the fatal error that unleashes an inexorable tragedy at the end of which he is no more. This is so because the musical instrument offers another way out. It breaks the spell of boredom, not by way of clarity, but by way of pleasure. I will go along with this momentous choice. Instead of meditation techniques, I am interested in musical techniques and in their capacity to orchestrate different conceptual orders into being. Let's start with the instrument. Part three, black boxing music. The Burmese harp, the Saungao, consists of a hollow body carved of one piece of wood covered with a hide into which are pierced sound holes. The arched arm that gives the harp its name attached, is attached with screws to the bottom of the resonator. It emerges at one end of the resonator from below the height, curving high above it. The 13 to 16 strings stretch out from the arch to a bridge, connecting them to the height. This, in brief, is how the Burmese harp is constructed. But this is not what it looks like, at least not entirely. In, nine, in the 1950s, American ethnomusicologist Muriel Williamson meticulously documented the construction process of a saungao at the workshop of Mandalay Lucia Umaji. The Lucia carefully chooses and carves the wood of resonator and arm, attaching one to the other. He applies and dries the deer skin and attaches strings and tuning tassels. The construction process is concluded, as Williamson puts it, by testing the tone and playing the first song. But then something quite extraordinary is done to the instrument. The harp is brought back into the workshop where strings and tuning tassels are removed again. Thick black lacquer is repeatedly applied to the entire instrument. In so doing, quote, the overlap of skin on resonator, brass struts, screws and wiring are buried under the thick paste so that the form of the harp emerges with no sign of constructional detail. In short, the instrument maker erases his own traces. All material discontinuities between skin and wood, arm and resonator are evened out. And here is an image of a 19th century lacquer coated harp topped with gold leaf, like an even shape. The material particularities that are so essential to the production of sound, the woodenness of the wood, the texture of the vibrating membrane, the height, are all erased. The technical structure of the instrument is quite literally black boxed. Originally crafted from highly specific and painstakingly processed materials, the harp now emerges as a unified shape. Form has trumped matter. But the lacquer does not merely cover and conceal, quite the contrary. Lucia Umaji would further sculpture with his assistant the black lacquer into a relief, relief, embellish the harp with pearls, jade, rubies and gold leaf, even adding his name, thus literally inscribing the instrument with meaning. When it comes to the harp that is seen today on the stage of the musical drama, the instrument's aestheticization is exaggerated even further. Flowers tucked into the sound holes and between the strings, thus occluding them, tip the instrument's ornamentation into a third dimension. The flowers have now broken away from the surface of the resonator and protrude into space. What emanates from the harp is no longer just a song 
about flowers, nor even in its beauty of lavish music and ornamentation like a flower. It is a flower, and the harp is its vase. Music has surpassed itself. Taken together, the lacquer, embellishment, and flowers engender substitution. The technical object is turned into an aesthetic one. The harp is no longer a mere device, a tool for fashioning something else, namely music. It is now an object in its own right, something to admire. This substitution brings about a halfway acousmatic situation. We still see the source of music. The instrument is even explicitly staged by the ornamentations as something to attract the eye. But the organological structure of the instrument, the material condition of sound, is occluded. The richly embellished coating of the instrument's construction seems to be saying, do not think that there is a technical process at work here. With the organological structure of the instrument concealed under flowers and varnish, the relation between musical sound and instrument has shifted. This is also evident from the Burmese terminology surrounding the sound gao. Musicians refer to the resonator of the harp variously as house, ain, pot, u, cup, kui, or trough, chin. In short, as something that contains something else. Instead of being materially produced by the instrument, the harp appears as a vessel that houses music. According to this container logic, the sound holes in the varnished deer skin allow music to emerge from the harp as someone emerges from a house. Inasmuch as those who step out of a house are not brought into being by the house, but have only inhabited it. Inasmuch as flowers do not grow out of a vase, but are only held together by it. Inasmuch as a cup does not bring water into existence, but only contains it, sound spills out of the instrument as if the harp had nothing to do with it, as if no technical process of making, no strings, no vibrating membrane, no resonant body, no tuning, were necessary for musical sound to exist. Although inhabiting the body of the harp, music has its own independent existence. Music precedes and exceeds the instrument. The construction of the harp suggests that instrument and music are made of entirely different stuff, one material, the other spiritual, one a passive container, the other a living being. They might cross each other's path in musical performance where the lavishly decorated harp serves as a worthy vessel for musical sound, but music and instrument are not tied together in any causal relation. On the contrary, they are separated by an immense abyss, on each side of which they maintain their own independent existence. At the bottom of this abyss lie the technical procedures and aesthetic operations. These are not simply dismissed as meaningless, rather they are made altogether redundant. Music can do without them. In obliterating the sophisticated technical structure of the instrument, the sound gao, the Burmese harp, turns out to be something like a material version of ide idealism. And this is my very point. Rather than rejecting idealism as wrong, I am interested in the practical procedures by which music is categorically separated from the material means of its production. Given the procedures of lacquer coating and embellishment, it does not suffice to say that Burmese musicians simply conceive music as an ideational object. And given the sophisticated methods of instrument building by which music is quite literally constructed, 
as transcendentally given, it also seems inappropriate to speak of music or sound in material terms as movement or vibration. Instead, any such claims about what music or sound is can be thrust aside if you look at the procedures and operations, the manners and means by which music is fashioned as one thing or another. The observation that technical and aesthetic procedures take priority over the categories and entities that emerge from them is not new. In fact, we find such ideas articulated in the writings of fifth century monk mentioned earlier, Buddha Gosa. Part four, thinking with technical objects. In the following, I will discuss a passage from Buddha Gosa's Vishu Dimaga, or Path to Purification. The Vishu Dimaga is a classic manual of Buddhist doctrine and meditation. As a commentarial text on the Pali Abhidhamma, it remains a central authoritative source in Burmese Buddhism. My reading of this ancient text that I can only access in translation relies heavily on the astute writings by Pali scholar Maria Haim. Most notably, technical objects come into play where Buddha Gosa ponders existence in the furthest sense, that is, in a particular analytical perspective. To think of things in the furthest sense means to challenge the common assumption that ordinary objects and beings, such as a house, a tree, a fist, the human, deities, a harp, and so on, are stable, self-contained entities. Instead, careful scrutiny reveals that all things are only metastable aggregations of component parts. Buddha, Buddha Gosa elaborates this perspective through several examples, starting with the most familiar one, the chariot. He explains that when the component parts, such as axles, wheels, frame poles, etc., are arranged in a certain way, there comes to be the mere term of common usage, chariot. Yet, in the furthest sense, when each part is examined, there is no chariot. Similarly, there is no house as such. There are only procedures of arranging the, quote, component parts of a house in such a manner that they enclose a space in a certain way. And the same goes for a fist, a harp, an army, a city, a human, and so on. In case of the Burmese harp, this means that although the thick lacquer and heavy decor render the instrument a unified self-contained object with its own unique being and identity, close analysis reveals that harps are simply an arrangement of, quote, body and strings, and so on. There are several things to note here. As Maria Haim observes, the abundance of etc. indicate that Buddha Gosa does not attempt to define any of these entities by listing their constitutive parts. Instead, these lists can be expanded and amended infinitely. But what interests me most in this passage is something else. And now things get a bit complex and we have to focus even more. Are you with me? <laughs> Beyond dissecting seemingly given entities, Buddha Gosa pre presents them as the result of particular and very concrete procedures, namely of arranging, of enclosing, of placing things in a certain way. Any entity, whether material or conceptual, involves creative process and technical operations for it to come about. This perspective not only reveals that things as such do not exist, it also permits another conclusion, namely, that no entity, not even the idea of that entity, exists 
independently from very concrete practical procedures. Music in this perspective has no metaphysical or ontological reality that would precede and exceed concrete procedures of sounding or of processing, for instance, the distinction with noise. Here, Buddha Gosa comes very close to what German media philosophy has described as Kulturtechniken, in English somewhat confusingly translated as cultural techniques. Research into cultural techniques precisely aims for, quote, a shift in the deconstruction of ontological categories to the level of technological materialism, as Bernhard Siegert had put it. And as I read it, Buddha Gosa does just that. The task at hand then is to unearth and describe the technical and aesthetic procedures and to consider them in their capacity to generate realities, distinctions and modes of being. This brings me to the final part of my talk. I would like to suggest that artists like librettist Go Maungji have transposed this Abhidhamma perspective into a specific aesthetic, one that repeatedly interrupts our common assumptions about what exists. This is done by revealing and staging the practical procedures by which things are first orchestrated into being. I refer to these scenes where the material conditions and technical procedures of music making surface in the musical and dramatic fabric itself as medial moments. In the following, I will single out three such moments in the scene of her playing at the shore. First medial moment. Sitting alone in the boat, anchored at the shore, our harpist deliberates. I should set up my harp and play it to relax. Now that I have just changed the harp strings, I'll try and play a song to test them out. And as, it's, as the stage directions add, Mao Xin tests the harp by playing the tune of Gandama Daung, or Mount Gandama. To play this classic song, a bue the chin, or eulogy, the harp must be set up in yinlon tuning. And this is what we hear first, the noise, not music, but, sorry, and this is what we hear first, not music, but the sound of strings being adjusted. But this is not all. The song he subsequently plays is not simply an aesthetic object either. The song still features as a musical procedure, namely as a means of testing the instrument. This practice of testing, san in Burmese or anspielen in German, English doesn't seem to have an equivalent word here, maybe you can give me one, um, is particularly pre prevalent among harp players who repeatedly have to adjust the strings of their instruments throughout a performance. Tuning while playing, playing while testing, renders any categorical distinction between tuning and music, strings and melody, porous, vague and highly ambiguous. But had the protagonist not picked up his instrument to dispel his mind-numbing boredom? Earlier in the libretto he remarks, I cling to this harp because when I feel the flames of trouble in my mind, I play the harp to relax myself. As I tune the strings of the harp, my mind is distracted and focused elsewhere. End of quote. The affective trajectories of music and tuning seamlessly interlace. Satisfaction is not limited to the musical composition. According to the librettist, it is already present in the bare strings. Tuning here neither disappears behind the tune as a mere condition of possibility, nor does the tune belong to a superior reality. Rather, the opera stages the tune as an expression of the strings, 
tuning and playing are presented as procedures that precisely interconnect material means and musical meanings. These musical operations then are not exterior to the opera. Instead, the techniques of operatic depiction, of telling a story by musical means, are inscribed into the scene, a theatrical mise en abume. Second medial moment. The song that the harpist sings deviates significantly from the original song poem, Gandama Mountain, by court artist and 19th century musical reformer Mayawadi Usa. Although keeping with Usa's imagery, the librettist comes up with his own text to be sung to the original melody of Usa's composition. When it comes to classical Burmese songs, text and music are inextricably linked. Music is handed down via the text of a composition, while a different text likely implies a different song altogether. Readers of the libretto must have therefore likely paused in surprise. Starting with the familiar phrase, Gandama Daum, librettist Gomangji, librettist Gomangji's lyrics take a different path. Rather than allowing his speculative audiences to dwell on familiar rhymes and rhythms, he interrupts them with his own words. In so doing, he inserts a hiatus into the music, a discontinuity. Melody and words, words and meanings obtain new relations. It's the same song, yet on the other hand, it's also different. Today, this difference amounts to an offense. When I asked Situ So from, to sing this version, he responded with surprise, insisting that it would be a crime not to use the original lyrics. No Burmese musician would accept these altered words that, moreover, wouldn't fit the tune in the first place. For the librettist, however, the potential discontinuity between words and music has existential weight. The librettist who elsewhere in the libretto defends himself against plagiarism establishes himself here as an original author in its own right, as someone who even dares to rival acclaimed poets of the past. In doing so, the librettist shows up in his own libretto. That medial moment. As the harpist launches into song, singing about his laugh for a woman he has not yet met, all boredom is forgotten. In song he gets ahead of himself. Let me embrace this moment of longing he sings, yet only to stop dead all of a sudden. Oops, a harp string just broke again. Once I have adjusted the strings, I'll play another song. At the turn of the 20th century, when the libretto was written, harp strings were made of raw silk. But these delicately hand-twisted threads, coming in different sizes, easily broke. This could happen at any point while playing, causing the music to stop dead, just as one was indulging in musical pleasures. The breaking of strings, however, did not just curtail music. The matter was an existential one. As Burmese British performer and scholar Noel Singer reports, it was considered a sign of ill omen at the royal courts if one of the strings snapped during a performance. It was, in fact, a punishable offence. End of quote. At stake in tuning and playing the silken strings of the harp was not only music, but the throne, the dynasty, the empire, indeed one's own existence. In the libretto, the snapping string anticipates the ending of the story as the end of the protagonist, the harpist Maung Shin. Playing his harp in the wilderness, his life comes to hang by a silken thread that would eventually break. 
The string thus signifies a fundamental tenet of Buddhist thought, namely that everything is impermanent. And that, in turn, permanence is an illusion. Observations as this, of course, remain tied to the level of representation and interpretation. But the broken string not only signifies something, it occasions a technical procedure. Fortunately, a broken string would not have to be replaced by a new one, one that might not be on hand. Instrument makers knew that music made by the harp came with the ever-latent danger of its sudden ceasing. In anticipation of their breaking, strings were made exceedingly long, allowing the player to pull the broken thread through the string hole on the bridge until it reached the neck of the harp again, where it could be reattached to the tassel and retuned. But there was, of course, a limit. Silken strings are not infinite. Impermanence could only ever be suspended. Thus, harp playing at the royal courts involved sophisticated techniques to effectively lever out the law of impermanence altogether. A harpist only entered the presence of the king with an assistant carrying a duplicate of the instrument. In case of a snapping string, the entire harp could swiftly be substituted. If one had just enough duplicates to rotate between hands that plucked strings and hands that repaired them, music could sound forever. The semantic shackle between silken strings and human or royal existence would be broken. By way of procedures of duplicating and replacing, the cosmological order could be outwitted and supplanted by a musical order that allowed a royal lineage to listen infinitely and thus to rule forever. As instruments that can be held and carried in one's hands, harps are indeed uniquely suitable to undo and redo reality. This third self-reflective medial moment in Gomangji's libretto, however, turns into a heretical one. It reveals that permanence is not at all an illusion, as Buddhism claims, nor is impermanence ontologically given. Rather, the continuity of existence turns out to be a practical problem, namely a question of medial operations, of repairing, readjusting, duplicating, replacing, rotating, retuning, and so on. Music is not a mere evanescent object of pleasure, one that aptly ex exemplifies the futility of attachment. Quite the contrary. Music is first and foremost something made, and as such, it can be made to be anything, even permanent. To conclude, Scholarship on music has often started from the assumption that there is something particular about sound or listening. But in the Abhidhamma perspective, advocated by 5th century monk Buddha Goza, music or sound as such do not exist. Instead, he draws attention to the procedures and techniques that allow for sound or music, for being or listening, to be all kinds of things and to show up in, in and as all kinds of relations, even within the same aesthetic milieu. And this is important. Instead of tying a particular notion of music or sound to a philosophical take, to a cultural location or to a collective, any idea of what music or sound is becomes a question of the procedures and operations at hand. While the construction of the sound gao, the harp, renders music transcendentally given, other concatenations of music making 
and staging may suggest entirely different configurations, different distinctions, different relations, different theoretical formations. These are not mutually exclusive. If sound has no existence as such, then there can also be no stipulated ontology of sound or music or listening, however cunningly an author might gather and present their evidence. Instead, the task at hand would be to trace the winding paths that lead from concrete musical procedures to different conceptual configurations. Thank you. Thank you.